This week on The Gadget Show, Jason, John and I all take to the hills. The ones where they train the SAS, to be precise, where we get battered, soaked, oh, hang on. <laughs> and frozen. Ah. All in the interest of testing survival gadgets. Are digital picture frames or pants? John does a bit of cold calling to find out. I've just come to show you these digital picture frames oh, to yeah. see what you think. Oh, I'm not interested, thank you. No, no. This week on The Gadget Show, the producers thought that it was time to take a look at survival gadgets. You know, the kind of stuff that explorers and their special forces use. Frustratingly, though, they didn't tell us. All we were told was to be in a certain pub car park in a certain part of the Brecon Beacons National Park at a certain time. So, what do you think we're doing, then? Just for a walk? Is that what you heard? No, no I wasn't allowed to bring my waterproof trousers. I haven't even got any boots. I'm in my trainers. Um, have you got any money? No. Normally, have you? Yeah. How much have you got? It's, it's in gold, in case I have to <laughs> give it to the natives, and it's inside my underpants. <laughs> so, basically, none of us have really got any idea of what we're doing here. No. No, but it's a very nice evening. Hang on, chaps, this looks a bit likely. Wow! Our first surprise was the arrival of a serious-looking truck which had bought a box of gadgety survival kit for each of us. Oh, that must be mine. Oh. It's for me! Hey! Look at that. Nice. Ah. <laughs> Oof. There you go, John. Oh, you've got two. Oh, oh, oh John. Look, he's puckering really up for mine. Do you want some help? Yeah? I'm amazed you could fit mine in the back of... What? Is that... You, you having a... Is it... Ah. You must be joking. How can you get yeah, anything that be, in there? Yeah, that might be the best. At all, apart from oh, packing material. Oh, thank you very much. Mm, you always have envelopes and these things. Shh, 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 shh. Mm. Ready? It's very exciting. OK. Hello, Gadget Show team. Over the next 24 hours, you will be competing 24. in our Grand Survival Challenge. Mm. You'll be camping out in the Brecon Beacons, then follow... Then... Oh, hang on. Then follow an SAS training route. Wow! We have provided each of you with equipment for this challenge. Susie, please open your box now. Right, let's see what I've got. A tent. Mm. I'm just going to need that. Oh, I've no, got that, a I Gladius Nighthawk torch. She's the most brilliant torch ever invented. That's you are lucky. Right. I've got a. Oh, no, hang on, hang on. Oh, I've got a. Hey, I've got a king size airbed. Right. It's got batteries, though, which means you'd have to pump it, it's automatic. I'll be tackling this challenge with the very best kit money can buy. I've got this fantastic jacket with built-in iPod control and a rucksack that twists and bends with the body to reduce fatigue. I'll be camping in luxury with one of the toughest tents in the world, a self-inflating king-size mattress and a twin hob cooker. I've got a video! This is not fair! Fantastic! Next, it was John's turn to unpack. An all-in-one romper suit for the countryside. Hey! We're going to a Excellent. fetish club. Brilliant! <laughs> I'll be taking to the hills with a selection of mid-range gear. This Rab expedition suit is apparently the world's warmest single item of clothing. I've also got an Arctic sleeping bag that's good down to minus 40 degrees and a highly recommended flexible rucksack. I have a small parabolic heater. Well, we can't help that, John. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, my unpacking didn't take too long. OK, a bin liner. Great. Oh, there's some more stuff in there. I'll be going basic and camping on a serious budget. This matching Dayglow waterproof trouser and cagoule set cost £8.99p from an Army and Navy store. And my torch is a pound shop special. I have an Army issue hexamine stove and this emergency bivy bag to sleep in. Great. We didn't have much time to think about our kit before we were blindfolded and bundled into the back of a waiting truck. <laughs> we were off for a night on a mountainside and there were a few surprises waiting for us. So you might just be dumped somewhere. To find out what they were, stick around. I found being blindfolded, even though I knew it was just a bit of fun, really intimidating. Did you? I found it quite exciting. Yeah, I, th I thought you would. No, only because we were all together and I didn't think anything really bad was going to happen. You know, I was trying to work out where we were going and, um, you know, how many bridges we were going over, which direction. I was doing that, turns in the road. Yeah, just in case we had to get back to the start point. That's what I thought, anyway. Yeah, and I, I think maybe because I'm a bit of a city boy, 
I'm just not used to being thrown into the wilderness. Uh, well, more of the survival challenge coming up later on, where it gets more exciting for me and a lot more scary for Jace. Now, have you seen this thing? What is it? It's called the sling box, and it's a really snazzy piece of kit. Do I need one? Uh, I think you do need one, actually, because you do a lot of travelling, don't you? Yep. All over the world she goes, and all these posh hotels, and this device, I think, would make your stay in hotels a lot more enjoyable. Well, because what's it doing? Well, you, you whack it in between your cable box, your satellite receiver, or your free view signal, in between that and your TV, and then um, it connects to the internet, mm -hmm. and enables you to watch your content that you'd normally enjoy from the comfort of your home anywhere in the world. All you need is a Wi-Fi connection and a laptop like this, OK? I connect to the net. I use a bit of software that I've got on my, on my laptop. I connect to this, and I can actually change channels. And, and back at home, my cable box or whatever it is will change channel, and I'll watch the content live on my laptop. So how much does it cost? I have no idea. Should I check? <laughs> yeah, that would be good. Hang on. Sling box uh, price, and I'll put a pound signed in so I don't get it in dollars. There we go. £179. Ah, that's quite good. Yeah, very good. So, now you know, you can watch us anywhere in the world. And while that wonderful news sinks in, it's time to take a break. After which, our survival challenge continues. And as we set up camp, a few surprises are sprung on us. Now, digital picture frames. They've been around for a few years, but it's only recently that they've become widely available. But are they actually any good? How much do you have to spend to get a good one? And should you make room for one in your living room? To find out, I went cold calling. Armed with a variety of digital picture frames, I tried sweet-talking my way into living rooms across the West Midlands, where I could test the frames in situ. Hello! 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 My name is John Bentley. I work for a program called The Gadget Show on Five. I'm uh, showing off some of these digital picture frames, see what people think of them. And I wonder if I might uh, show you it. Man of obvious taste and distinction like yourself. I'm good! I started off in the home of a friendly young chap called Nick, where I tried out an entry-level frame, the £90 Crystal. Can I ask you a cup of tea, Tom? Oh, yes. Cup of old gravy, super. It takes a range of memory cards and conveniently finds any pictures on them automatically. Aha! Play your photos, listen to your music or watch video. The remote control apparently makes it easier to program the frame. I say, apparently. Oh, look, it goes twice every time. Looks clumsy. Oh. It proved a real pig to use. Music. It took me almost 20 minutes to set up a simple slideshow sequence. Well, it's very hard to use the remote. It seems to be extremely unresponsive, but that pales into insignificance beside the fact that the pictures look absolutely awful. It's just a collection of rather ugly-looking blobs. In fact, you can hardly see the pictures for the pixels. And I have to say, the colours are frightful. Um, I think you'd be very hard-pushed to have much enthusiasm for this. I think it's a pretty appalling piece of kit. So it appears that cheap is not very cheerful in the world of digital picture frames. Time to move up market to the £400 Pacific Digital Frame and my next host, an attractive lady called Evelyn, who was more than happy to let me set up in her dining room. The frame has no slots for a memory card. Instead, it loads directly from your computer via a USB port. The idea is that you set up your slideshow sequence on your PC, then transfer it using the dedicated software. Problem is, it's nowhere near as convenient or quick as just slotting in a memory card. Can I need some refreshments? Could you've been here a long time. It's taking a while, isn't it? I know. It's uh, wrong picture number 39 now out of 40. Oh, I think gosh. Go. Ooh, cake. How delightful. There you go. Thank you very much. Mmm. As for picture quality, there's plenty of definition, but the colours are a bit dull. So, it's not a bad effort, but uh, I'm not sure it's worth £400. The frame also claims to be Wi-Fi enabled, so that you can beam pictures to it anywhere in the house from your computer. But despite hours of trying, I just couldn't get the damn thing to work. This was getting annoying. Frequently asked questions. Why doesn't it work? Answer, it's rubbish. 
And so, increasingly frustrated, I moved on. I'm not selling anything, don't worry. I've just come to show you these digital picture frames to oh, see yeah. what you think no, of them. I'm not interested, thank you. No, no. no Would you mind no, if I just you. come in just to... You don't need to have a look, honestly. I'm not asking you to oh, buy anything okay, at all. Okay, I finally sweet-talked my way into the home of Peter and Gladys to test my final frame, the two grand brilliance triple. This is my wife, Gladys. This is John. He's coming to sell some picture frames. But I don't Hello, know much of you. How do you do, John? Very nice to meet you. Ah, tea. Brilliant. The clue to why the Brilliance triple is so big is in the name. It has three separate screens. Sounds interesting, although triple pictures means triple cables and triple memory cards. The most worrying thing about it is I can't get this third frame to work at all. In spite of disconnecting and reconnecting the power supply and various other things. And I'm just getting a blank screen. I think it would drive you mad, actually because uh, the remotes are a real problem anyway. I can even tell with just the two screens. Now, to operate the remotes, you're supposed to put a, make a little tube with your hand and send the signal through so it doesn't affect all the other screens, which does work, but seems remarkably primitive for <laughs> something that costs two grand. And for two grand, you should get the best possible quality, but you don't. I found the pictures to be most unsatisfactory, fuzzy and pixelated. I'm not sure I'd pay 20 quid for this. Pete and Gladys were equally unimpressed and asked me to leave because CSI was about to start on the telly. I ended my days testing utterly disappointed by digital picture frames. And for the first time since I'd been testing stuff on the gadget show, I was convinced I could do better myself. So I went straight home, got out the tools, and using an old flat-screen computer monitor, some architraving, and a tube of wood glue, set about making my own digital picture frame. And here it is, my frame. Wow. 100 quid for an LCD monitor and 6.99 for the finest quality architraving. That, honestly, that is really impressive. But right. the fact is that that actually works, whereas the ones that we've just seen you looking at seemed, well, quite frankly, to be a little bit rubbish. How much in that, that one with three pictures in it, where the left monitor that didn't work nice. and you had to put your finger in a cone, how much does that retail at? A couple of grand. Unbelievable. 20 times yourself. the price of mine. And this how long did it go. take you to make that, John? It did take a few hours, but I'm not the most practised at do-it-yourself. Uh, in the world. Oh, I think you've done a really good... I think you could do, actually. Degrees get well, you can use anything for the frame. Well, you could, you could actually take yeah. a monitor to a, fr a professional framers and say, frame that. I bet it'd only cost you 100 quid, and you'd have a really mm. super job. And you've got... You can show your video, you say all sorts of you things. You can show anything on this, actually. Yeah, I mean, I know the, uh, all the other frames claim to do sound mm -hmm. and video, but none of them did it very well. So, uh, out of all the ones that you tested, wasn't there anything at all that looked good or impressed you? Well, there was just one, which... Retails at about 169, but I'm sure you can get it cheaper than that. It's from Philips, mm. seven inch, and it just does what it says it does. It doesn't do video, it doesn't do sound, but the actual resolution's quite good, the colours are quite good. It's very easy to control, you just pop the card in and you can easily go to indexes, set the shows you want. And um, it's not actually normal 4x3 proportions, it's actually more like a, an SLR digital proportion, 2x3, yeah. but I don't think that's a problem. I have, to, I have a confession to it. I actually yeah. have one of these. The, the mother-in-law bought me one for Christmas. Oh, that's a nice present. It is a really nice present, mm. and I, I've mm. got to say, it is absolutely brilliant. Interesting, I've got it on a shelf, and next to it, either side, are two normal pictures in frames. Mm. And what's interesting is it looks the same. You know, the contrast mm. is the same as an actual photograph in a real frame. That's you, good quality, though. You don't actually need to worry it in, because no, it does can, last for several hours on batteries. Yeah, yeah let's demonstrate it. They're, they're yeah. the power cable. I like and, that, it's good. And it's still working, so that, that's really impressive. Mm. So I think that's probably the only one to go, or make your own. Now it's time to return to our Brecon Beacons challenge. Earlier you saw us as we just received some instructions and a load of camping gear. Now what you need to remember for this bit is that I had a tent that should be able to withstand a Force 12 gale. Jason had a survival kit that is meant to be completely waterproof. And John had this rather attractive romper suit that should keep him warm in temperatures down to minus 40 degrees. Now, the last time you saw us, we were blindfolded in the back of the truck. As you rejoin us, we're still there. Remember, we had been told we'd be spending the night under the stars, but we hadn't been told how, why or where. So where are we going? I don't know, Susan. I've got a blindfold on. Oh, yeah, sorry, I can't see you. 
I think we've gone left, right, right, left, up a hill a bit, past a tractor with a dodgy clutch, and then right. So you don't know either, John? I haven't a clue. After a while, the truck pulled to a stop. Are you going? And I was left on my own. It was scary, but things were about to look up. What now? Oh, I've got some food. <laughs> to go with my luxury kit, I had luxury food. Tuna steaks, green beans, champagne and a fresh cream cake. We headed off again and after a while it was my turn to be abandoned. Good luck. Wow. Cameraman. I am in the middle of nowhere. Just like Susie, I'd been dropped in the Brecon Beacons National Park. It's a beautiful area, but shouldn't be underestimated. It's where the SAS train. John's journey continued while I struggled with my camp. <laughs> I might as well set up camp. Well, that's my camp. <laughs> I've got the wrong way around, haven't I? I was pretty hungry, so I tucked into my children's size can of baked beans. Meanwhile, I was taken on a very long drive and deposited in what sounded suspiciously like civilization. Oh, that feels cold. Bloody hell. Okay, Already, are we in? We're not in yet. Meat cleavers, horrible things. Bones, knuckles. In case things get nasty. It was genuinely disconcerting to be in a butcher's freezer after an hour blindfolded in the back of a truck. But at least it was clear why I had the Arctic equipment. I'd be spending the night in the freezer to test my kit. This is not bloody the pleasant country walk I had in mind. While John was left to suffer, my only real problem was boredom. A few sheep coming over to say hello. Not a great deal to do in terms of entertainment. So I think I'm going to settle down in my little camp and read the back of one of my boxes. A revolutionary survival sleeping bag providing total protection against the elements in a pack little bigger than a video cassette. Absolutely superb. It's more than twice as warm as goose down, yet completely waterproof and windproof. You see, that's what I want. Well, I've finished my reading and I reckon I'm going to get to sleep now because I'm a bit tired. It's dry, it's not raining, so I might as well go to sleep. So, hey, sleep tight. So I settled down to a nice, quiet night in the open air. Or so I thought. There's a noise outside. And I've got to be honest with you, I reckon this is the gadget show playing silly buggers. They reckon they're going to get me, but I've, I've got this bag. Oh. I'm pulling this shot here, look. I'm sure I can hear water. Oh, hang on. <laughs> they decided to test just how waterproof my 25-pound bag was. I feel really safe. I feel totally safe. I know this must look awful because it's all steamed up and out of focus. There's no room to move the camera because, you know, this is my tent. This is it. Despite their best work, I stayed completely dry. All right, lads. Good work. Thanks for that. To a very pleasant evening in the Brecon Beacons and a new series of the Gadget Show. I was getting quite into this camping lark. It was most pleasant. Look at that. So lucky, and I haven't got to do anything bad. I don't know what's going to happen to me. Something's got to happen. Something bad. It's all been too easy and good. I've just been reading about my tent, and apparently it's one of the toughest tents in the world, and it's built to withstand really strong winds, the kind of winds that you get on expeditions to places like Mount Everest. And it's because of this geodesic design, 
we've got three poles, two there and one there, if you can see that, that cross in a sort of arch design, which makes it much stronger. However, um, as you saw outside, it's very calm tonight, so I don't think I should have any problems at all. But the Gadget Show team were up to mischief again, and I was due a rude awakening. This 6,000 RPM wind machine is capable of churning out a 65 miles an hour Force 11 gale. This may be one of the toughest tents in the world, but if it's been put up badly, then it's next to useless. What is that? Oh my God, what are they doing to me? so strong that the cameraman could barely stand, but I was safe. The tent is made from extremely tough nylon that's coated with silicon, so it's even tougher, and it simply won't rip. And just bring it on, you can do whatever you like. I feel completely secure in the knowledge that I've got one of the best tents in the world. Thank you very much. Bring it on, bring it on. I was still in the freezer. I'd been given sausages and bacon to cook, but my kit wasn't really designed for this environment. I can't use my portable stove in a freezer because of the carbon monoxide hazard. Using it in an enclosed space can kill you. As if the minus 18 degrees centigrade won't kill you. It's down to the Boddingtons and the cakes and me buns. So, um, I think I'll just I'll try and get into my sleeping bag. Ooh. It was down to minus 40 degrees, you see. That's good, isn't it? So I've got, I've got at least 22 degrees in reserve. It's going to be fine. It's going to be a picnic. Night. Night, night. Shut that door, please. Let's see the heat in. Did you manage to get to sleep? Yeah, when the I mean, fire brigade decided to leave me alone, yeah. <laughs> I, I slept quite well. What about you, John? Did you sleep in that freezer? I managed to get to sleep, but I woke up because I was too hot. Because I don't think minus 18 degrees is actually cold enough to test those amazing things which are designed for the Antarctic. They were That's just amazing. too You were in the freezer and you were too hot. So you were sweating. Mm. Uh, but you know, Jason's kit altogether cost a grand total of £38. Oh, how embarrassing. <laughs> This week, we're looking at gadget watches. And I'm going first, because I think I've got one that's very appropriate for Survival Challenge Week. Ah. Look at it. It's the world's smallest GPS watch. Oh, cool. Oh. Now, what would you think a GPS watch would be for? Uh, well, lo location yeah, to show where you, you are. Tell where you are. Yeah. yeah. No. Oh. Oh. Because this one is actually for people who do a lot of exercise, because it uses that signal that tells you where you are and measures how fast you're walking, how fast you're running, where you've been. Oh. I'm, I'm a bit disappointed, actually. Why, well, because you don't do much exercise? Mm. Yes, and, the, and because, you know, the idea of having a map on your watch is That's quite good, cool. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't actually even show you your coordinates. That's no good. But, and also it's no good for running a Silly marathon. Thing. Why not? Because the battery lasts for two hours. Oh, that's, that's almost kind of useless, really, isn't it? But if it's the sort of thing that you do want, it'll be available next month and it'll be hundreds of pounds. OK, so if, you, if, you, if you're a serious runner, though... Yeah, if you're a serious runner, you don't yeah. run marathons every day, so it's your training for the marathon. Mm. It would be good for something People like who do a lot of training, it could be a very good watch. But it's a little bit misleading in the name, I think, though, isn't I, it? I do, too, yeah. I think Maybe a sports watch or something. Training watch. Yeah. 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 Something, not a GPS watch. What have you got, Joe? Well, OK, I, I've got something that I, I have to say I, I really like. Like, but I think it's completely pointless. It's the world's first ever Morse code watch. That's what time yeah. it is. What time is it? I can hardly hear it. And what time is that? I haven't a clue, John. I haven't the foggiest. You see, what I think is really funny about this is that, you know, to me, the watch is a little bit like the bicycle. You know, it's a piece of technology that has evolved over hundreds of years and is just about as good as it can get. You know, you glance at your watch and in a millisecond you know exactly what time it is. You don't even need to engage the brain, do you? It's almost mm -hmm. kind of, you know, it's almost ambient, you know, it goes straight into your perception. 
uh, what they've done is they've kind of gone back a couple hundred years <laughs> and they've made it, they've made it beat. And you know, I'm a big fan of radio. I, I've even done my Morse code exam as a radio amateur. And, and I, even I don't think that Morse code is necessary. Yes, once you're showing on the display, does it show anything? Uh, yeah, it, it also shows you the, uh, the time in Morse digits, which is oh. like hieroglyphics. I mean, it's even harder to see well, than visual Morse code. So basically, this is for people that are obsessed Morse with Morse code? It is. The only, the only use I can think of, though, is, is that if you're blind, it will be useful. But then why not just have a voice saying, it's 637? <laughs> it defeats the point. But hey, it's a cool gadget, and I like it because it's so ridiculous. Well, I think my watch might have its uses. It's called Bloom Voice, and I know it, it's not aesthetically that pleasing to the it's, eye, it's is it really? Thing. But watch, when your phone rings by Bluetooth technology, you can take this and just pop it in oh, your cool. ear and take like your that. phone call. Mm, yeah, that's okay. useful, because that's something you never have with you. Uh, now, you the thing about... Get it in your no, do you know what? It I think it's got the wrong work. size. It's it's very big big to get it does come with three little, Go three on, different so sizes. Put your hands away. There we go, All thank right, you. Okay. Uh, You've got the time on your ear. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, well, there you go, you see? So the next time someone says to you, have you got the time on you, you can say, I've got it right here. Right here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's go to a break. Oh. But stick around, because after the break, it's the climax of our survival challenge. We put GPS to the test in a three-way race across the Brecon Beacons. And believe me, it's anything but a stroll in the countryside. John and Jason are going to beat me and I'm going to be the loser forever. And I'm not very happy about that! I can't lose, I can't lose, I can't lose. Now it's time for the final part in our survival challenge. Incidentally, if you want any more information on any of the stuff that we've tested in the hills, you can get it on our website, 5.tv slash gadget show. So, to recap, we were told to meet in the middle of nowhere, taken blindfolded into the mountains, unceremoniously dumped with varying degrees of resources to survive the night, and if that wasn't enough, in the morning we were set one further challenge, a race. Morning. Morning. Oh. Oh, morning. The postman has been. Well, what's in here? <laughs> Another challenge, no doubt. This envelope contains your navigation device. Yes. And a series of coordinates. You must follow these routes to the finish, where you will meet your fellow presenters. This is a race. And the last person to arrive shall be known forevermore as... A loser. The word does not exist in my vocabulary. What have I got? Ooh, it's got a bit of kit in there. What have we got in there? I'd been given this £400 Garmin, the latest version of a device used by the SAS, so it should be at home here. The controls were really easy to pick up, and there's a variety of full-colour direction screens and a decent map screen. The new highly sensitive antenna got my position to within 14 feet. And after a couple of minutes, I'd picked up eight satellites and had the finished coordinates programmed in. Right, all set, ready to go, and it looks like I've got to go this way first. This could be a long walk. I've got this entry-level system with a black and white display and fairly basic navigation screens. But for 85 quid, what do you expect? Find their satellites, in my experience. It took about five minutes to lock onto seven satellites and the tiny buttons were fiddly with my frozen fingers, but as I thought out, it got much easier. The Magellan got my position to within 30 feet, and I was on my way. Let's follow it. <laughs> See what happens. Morning. What have we got in there? Hang on, she's not looking good. A map and a compass. <laughs> ah, OK, well, it is a navigation device, obviously but <clears throat> not quite the full-colour GPS sat-nav that I was hoping for. I needed to work out where I was, something a GPS does for you. I had to try and triangulate my position based on what I saw around me. I know where I came from. I know that it was on the A40. Um, west, that big, dirty, great big hill. Triangulation is sort of how a GPS works as well. 
GPS devices need to pick up the signal from at least three US Air Force satellites. There are 24 of them in orbit, 12,000 miles above us, and they cover the whole globe. Where the signals from the satellites in range intersect is where you are. I'm kind of here. I think that's where my target is. I reckon I'm just going to go for it. After about 20 minutes, I was on my way and hopefully headed yeah. in the right direction. I needed to get a move on, though. It's going to be a bit tricky. I'd got a good head start, but I was facing a problem. Not having programmed a precise route and not actually being in the SAS, I couldn't always we'll follow my GPS instructions exactly. Yeah. Yes, well, from minus 18 degrees to plus 18 degrees, and in this thing, I'm very hot. I'm going to have to do something about that in a minute. Ooh. Having cooled down, I was actually quite impressed with the little Magellan. There are no frills, but it was coping quite well keeping a signal in this tree-covered gorge, where its view of the sky was often disrupted. I can see that the distance now is 1.83 miles to the finish. Oh, fantastic, look at this. I had to keep stopping to refine my directions based on landmarks until I was 100% sure I was in the right place. The other two could just keep on going, eating up the miles. Only my superhuman feats of endurance were keeping me in the game. Hey, listen, John, um, how, how far into the trek do you think you are? I'm about 1.8 miles away from the finish point. I've got the destination in my sights. I hope you're getting a move on, because I mean business. You've walked 12 miles? Yeah, I think so. I'd love to talk, Susie, but, you know, got a competition to win. You know what, I think you might be a bit closer than me. I've got to go. Bye. Right. John, he's nearly there. Saying that way. Oh, yes. John and Jason are going to beat me, and I'm going to be the loser forever. And I'm not very happy about that. Come on, Garvin, it's you and me, baby. I can't lose, I can't lose, I can't lose. Did I finish? <laughs> Will you keep up? Come on. See, I'm that triangle, and there's the blue flag. That's the finish. It can't be Quite far away. Europe. So close, so close, according to this. If I'd had a laptop with me, I could have downloaded a map of the town onto an SD memory card and slotted oh, it into my Garmin. It would have made the final approach way, so way, much way. easier. Yes, that way. Well, according to this, I'm at the finish. I should be literally yards away. A couple of buildings here. It's Hopefully, it might be that one with the hanging baskets. That looks like a pub. Let's go there. <laughs> Ooh! Uh, I'm going to go with this one, because I think it's pointing more in this direction. As I run like a maniac, I bet they're just sitting there. Arriving at the finish. Liking the sound of that. Let's see if anyone's here. Excuse me. You've got um, a bald guy and a guy with grey hair in there that are wearing strange clothes. No. You soon will have, but thank you. Oh, yes! Oh, yes! Ultimately, the tree cover did affect my Magellan, losing the signal and wasting vital minutes. <laughs> And having to stop all the time to read my blooming map, but paid to my chances. I can see it. It's here. No, I don't believe it. Which means I'm the winner and they're both losers. Yeah, thanks for that, Susie. You didn't have to spend the night in a crisp packet. Or a freezer. This challenge has hardly been fair. Losers. Oh, yes. So, because you lost, you've been trying to stay incognito since, yeah? Well, I've found a certain amount of kinship online, and, <laughs> you know, I, I, I can't pretend that I don't like the, the feel of nylon on skin. Is that, mm. make, is that wrong? Do you think you look good? I like think that? I look fantastic. Mm. I think it's a very... I think I have the most efficient kit, you know? In the true definition of efficiency, you with your inflatable mattress and your four SAS masseurs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> genuinely, how quickly could you run? Even though you were assisted by satellite. Well, well, that is the point, isn't it? I did have a backpack on and stuff. Although, to be honest, I, I sort of barely noticed that it was there. It was pretty comfortable. And I did leave most of my kit there. But, I mean, in terms of these, A to B, 
it, it was it was it, very quite simple to use. If I had to have either this or Jason's map out yeah. in the middle of Wales, I'd go for Jason's map well, every time. I think that's an interesting point because yeah. once I knew where I was, which of course you guys didn't have to worry about, you were kind of off and, and at it straight away. Once I knew where I was, then I'd agree with you. I think it is the simplest method because you get a kind of cognitive sense well, of where you are. It actually yeah. does tell you where you are, whereas yeah. this, this is only giving you a figure. It's e and, exactly uh, that. and if somebody's programmed in a couple of points to it, just a general direction. So you have to make everything up after that. So you know you're going from A to B, but between A and B, there could be a really great big mountain. The only way these would work on their own is if you spent the night before you were going on your walk putting in literally hundreds of waypoints like down to the, a few metres apart. Which probably would have helped you pass the time, wouldn't it, in your freezer? Instead of playing about with that meat cleaver. <laughs> it could have got very dangerous, actually. <laughs>